Max, we know in the Milky Way is a galaxy. There are other galaxies nearby. Andromeda, part of our local group, and that's part of a local cluster. And then there's great walls we hear about. When we try to understand the large scale structure of the universe, how can we begin to think about it? I think uh, people have always wondered about the large scale structure of their world. And like when ancient explorers went on a walk, they found new forests, new lakes, and <laughs> they thought maybe it just goes on like that forever. Right? And then they realized, no, we live on this ball, that's it. And, but then people started studying more and realized there's the solar system, our star, the sun, and other stars. And it started to seem like maybe things were uniform after all. You just have more and more stars going on forever. Mm -hmm. And then a second time, people realized, no, there's an end to that also, our galaxy. And there's this beautiful spiral structure, for these arms and so on. And it's enormous. It's 100,000 years just for light to fly from one side to the other. So maybe that's it. And that's pretty much the universe that my grandma grew up in. And then people started to realize that there are other galaxies starting in 1925 when people realized that this Andromeda was a different one. And more galaxies, more galaxies, more galaxies. And people started to think that maybe that just goes on forever. But when people started doing cartography on a cosmic scale, they realized To that make maps. To make maps, except in three dimensions now, not yeah. two dimensions, yeah. right? Yeah. It was clear pretty quickly that Galaxies are very social and like to hang out near other galaxies. <laughs> so you have this cluster, these clustering patterns. We live in the local, our Milky Way is part of the local group of galaxies. And, and then- Like how many in that a, group, roughly? A, a group of galaxies might be 10. Then you can have hundreds of galaxies in a huge cluster mm -hmm. that are orbiting around each other. Mm. A little bit like a giant solar system, except messier. And then those clusters, can be part of superclusters which can, and giant filamentary structures, which are still larger. So in the largest maps that have been made so far from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, for instance, it's just amazing to me how every time we take a, another step back, we see still more structures, still larger patterns. And this is of a gigantic scale. Yeah, we're talking about things now that are so far away that if you were over there and you looked back here from the most distant galaxy we have ever seen, you would see this part of space more than five billion years ago, so Earth wouldn't even have formed yet, yeah, right? Wow, That's wow. how large scales there are. Wow. And the entire region of space from which light has a time to reach us so far, since the Big Bang, seems, again, rather uniform, though. You have all these clusters, but eventually it seems to smooth out, and people have started speculating as to maybe that was the end of structure as we know it. However, <laughs> that hasn't stopped a lot of people from wondering what lies beyond that. And really the best theory on the market, inflation, predicts that if you could zoom out still more, you would get still grander structures lying beyond that. So, uh, and, and each of those structures lying beyond it would, would have some relationship to, the, to each other in some structural way. That's right, that's right. Wow. So to me, the most interesting question to ask in, con in connection with measurements is, where did that structure come from? Then, right. you know? And when we find structure here on Earth, like a building, we can say, oh, that's because somebody built it. But what put all this structure in the galaxy patterns, and the, the way they're distributed? And uh, there it turns out that there's a very, very simple explanation. If you just start out with all, with things almost uniformly spread out, then gravity will tend to clump this and clump it more and more and, and create these amazing patterns if you just assume that early on, when the universe was, say, 400,000 years old, there was just a little bit of clumpiness at the level of about one part in 100,000. And finally, very recently, this was the big Nobel Prize for Smooth and Mather, it was possible to take photos of that epoch and check this prediction, hmm. if things really were totally uniform or if they were a little bit clumpy. And what they found with their Kobe team was, lo and behold, there are little patterns in these baby pictures of the universe. Yeah. There is a, about tenth of, there's about one part in 100,000 more stuff in some places than others, which is exactly what you needed for gravity then to, to 
produce this fantastic structure we have. So, so let me try to understand Here, this structure. Universe, it's yours. It's just, <laughs> I just don't want to prop it. it. <laughs> Ruin our old universe. So to understand structure in the universe, I have to make, I start with almost uniformity, but then very small differences, one part in 100,000. Right. And then one force, the force of gravity, over very long periods of time, That's right. hundreds of thousands, millions, Gotta hundreds of millions. You have to be patient. <laughs> you have to be patient. That the force of gravity will then magnify these very small quantum differences, and, and that produces the structure that you talked about? That's right. So it's an astonishing transformation from boring and simple to interesting and complex. And gravity really seems to be the, the key behind that. But that still does not answer, of course, the question of who planted those seeds? What mechanism was it that set things up with these tiny fluctuations? Yes. Because if it had been completely uniform, it would have stayed completely uniform. Or if it would have been more clumpy to begin with and not so homogenous that gravity might have clumped things together and it would it'd all be just a few big black holes in the world. And that would not have <laughs> been so good. Exactly. Exactly. So we're sort of on a fine line or intermediary between total uniformity, which is boring, or just a few large black holes around, which is almost equally boring. This number, 10 to the power of 5, is one of the most important numbers in nature, actually, because as you say, if it were very different, we wouldn't be here. It turns out if it were much, much, if it were substantially smaller, you would never have been able to make any galaxies before the dark energy took over and other problems ensued. And if it were much bigger, other bad things would happen. So it's a very exciting question, why the number has that value. It's also just a very interesting question of what physics could have created such, mm -hmm. such patterns. Mm -hmm. and, and there we have this amazingly beautiful explanation, which is, I think, the most elegant theory I've ever heard in, in the history of science, uh, the theory of inflation was invented not to answer that, but to explain why space is so big and why there was a bang. But shortly after Alan Guth and his colleagues worked that out, it became clear that inflation also produces these seed fluctuations uh, as a bonus. Uh, you got more out of this theory than it was designed to make. That's always the great excitement of science when you find that. It is, and that's when you really start to be convinced that there is some truth to something, right? when you get more out of it than you put into it. Than you originally planned it to solve. Yes. It solves that good, great, but suddenly it solves something you didn't even ask it. It just came in totally from left field wow. and also gives the seeds for galaxy formation. And one of the beautiful things about these precision maps that are being made now is that you can study in very great detail exactly how much clumpiness there is, how many big splotches there are, how many small splotches there are. Mm -hmm. And the theory of inflation makes some very specific predictions for a, whole, for a number of numbers that one can extract from this. And so far, it's all bang on what we've actually measured in this. Mm. So um, in summary, when we look around us and try to understand where everything came from, mm. I find it really astonishing that not only have we found structure on still grander scales than we ever thought we would, even vastly extending beyond the scale of galaxies. But we've also co come upon a surprisingly elegant and simple explanation for what created this structure. And it, even though these sound like very metaphysical and philosophical <laughs> questions, it predicts a bunch of numbers. We can go out and measure those numbers, and it agrees. And the remarkable thing is the incredibly small has created the incredibly large. Yes. So this unification between the microcosm and the macrocosm is the ultimate <laughs> unification, really, how these subatomic quantum fluctuations through the stretching of space. And the working of gravity. Yes. So that's one of the reasons I, I just love thinking about cosmology. <laughs> it's just so cool. <laughs>